I'm not offering any kind of great insight here, but it's somehow an insight that has never occurred to a shockingly large number of people in modern culture. They have lived their whole lives without anyone responding to one of their complaints by saying, yeah, that's life, get over it. Stop crying, you sissy. Them both butt dishes. Your wife said dishes, and she also threw in, he doesn't know how to do the laundry. Again, being thrown under the bus. I don't know if there's any Gen Zers watching me right now. Apparently, says Matt Walsh, you're weak. They used to say the same thing about us, don't worry. Uh, they used to say millennials were lazy. Yeah, that, that we were obsessed with avocado toast. And that's why we're okay with destroying society, because we just can't get enough of that delicious avocado toast. And apparently we ruined soup, because soup sales went down, because not as many millennials were, were eating soup. And, you know, and, and motorcycles too. We weren't buying as many motorcycles or something like that. I don't know. It, nothing to do at all with the difficulty in trying to, you know, uh, live outside of your parents' place and the economy being what it was and what it slowly is becoming and what it's becoming and becoming. And with the housing crisis and the cost of housing increasing ever so much that now the requirements sometimes are $200,000 required just to be able to get the loan to be able to get the house itself. Like, yeah, that can that can add a little bit to the living with your parents aspect that can certainly certainly uh, play a role uh, I'll say in addition to everything else but it's just I'm just saying it's it's a theme older generations like to yell at clouds and as the clouds become scarier to them and they start to envision those clouds are actually chasing them at all times and haunting them well then they start to obviously believe that the younger generation may pose a threat because they're lazy they're lazy they're lazy and they've got weird new things like pronouns and such for our daily cancellation today, we consult Fortune magazine, which reports that Gen Z, according to research, may be psychologically scarred by high inflation. Even worse, says this research, the damage may be permanent. Reading on, Gen Z's early careers uh, have been stifled by a number of challenges, from a once-in-a-generation pandemic and a war on European soil to spiraling living costs and recession fears that have led to widespread layoffs. But according to new research, the economic backdrop in which young people are entering, the workforce could have a much deeper impact on Gen Z than a squeeze on their lifestyles. Dayo Sawa, founder of London's Awa Business School and a former lecturer at Cambridge Good University's attempt. Judge Business School, told Fortune on Monday that the ongoing battle with uh, inflation would have had a serious impact on the mindset of Gen Z workers, those mm. under age, uh, those age 26 and under. Gen Z will be left with psychological scars from persistent inflation due to increased uncertainty and anxiety, he cautioned. A society- I, I don't know, just hearing that, that sounds like shit. I, I mean, like, yeah, that, that would be like my, if I, if I got that knowledge, that's kind of where my mind would go. I'd be like, yeah, that sounds terrible. Probably not great. In addition to all the other anxieties that younger generations have to deal with, it's like, hey, you know that whole climate change thing? Yeah, we, we didn't figure it out. We knew about it. We <laughs> we signed an accord or something, and we were going to keep keep the temperature low to like under 1.5 or something. We didn't do that. Um, but you, you and your generation, you'll grow up during the worst of the worst that we'll experience in relation to that. So... Yeah, um, hopefully you do a better job, you know, you can say for so much of time that it was the boomers that fucked everyone over, but as the millennials begin to age into boomer positions, it starts to become a little bit more of a, well, we, we still haven't really decided. There's good news, there's lots of tons and tons of good news, right? But that's usually dwarfed by the exceptionally depressing, rapid, bad news in, in, in that particular category. Where the young have little to no hope for the future is not a sustainable one. Not only will Gen Z be left with psychological scars, society at large will also feel the impact of those scars. So young people are not just dealing with a rocky economy, they are experiencing permanent psychological damage, a terminal loss of hope, and a profound sense of unease and anxiety. Now, of course, we hear a lot about the- That makes a lot of sense. If you combine that with the fact that they're all, you know, born into being online, unlike my generation, right? Like, I grew up at a time before the internet even existed. It was just a bunch of old dudes and a whole bunch of campuses communicating over telephone lines back in those days. You know, like, uh, if you are perpetually online or just born into that world where so much 
of your own sense of well-being is hyper engineered by AI driven algorithms that are constantly trying to get you to like, retweet, repost, get that new thing, chase that fix, chase that fix, chase that fix. They're all hyper engineered with the same kind of like, you know, triggers that uh, are done towards gambling uh, uh, systems and stuff like that, slot machines and the like. And, and it's uh, intentionally in a lot of ways curated to uh, promote more incendiary content because that's what keep, keeps people online more. Like starting that at a very young age and growing up in that, that has got to do a number on you and the way you think, you know, in addition to all of this. Who struggle with anxiety about their uh, anxious thoughts. And while experiencing anxiety is nothing new for Gen Z, uh, more than half of uh, survey respondents, 54%, said their anxiety has been worse. By the way, this is all coming from a guy who makes a living off making a lot of their lives scary, you know? Because not just people who happen to be, say, trans or LGBTQ+, plus or part of a visible minority group. I I'm just talking about people who don't want those people to suffer, either. But you got Matt Walsh's of the world being like, oh, here's a whole bunch of lies. You know, just blah, there's all these lies. And now here's a whole bunch of hospitals and schools. And, and, and they're telling these lies and they're abusing children. Go forth and do with that as you will. This year. And out of those with anxiety, 43% said they experience a panic attack at least once a month, if not more frequently. The most common cause of their anxiety, the future. Almost uh, most of those surveyed have said the future was the, was the biggest worry, while 45% said it was finances. Almost one in three Gen Zers surveyed with anxiety said they used medication to help them manage the symptoms. Okay, 61% have been medically diagnosed with anxiety disorder. So think about that for a second. That's a, that's a staggering number, 61%. That is how anxious these young people are. And, and many of them are having panic attacks once a month. I don't even know what a panic attack is. I, 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 but, but. <laughs> so I feel qualified to talk about this in detail right now and uh, talk about how lazy they all are. Panic attack is a sudden episode of intense fear that triggers severe physical reactions when there's no real danger or apparent cause. Panic attacks can be very frightening. When panic attacks occur, you might think you're losing control, having a heart attack, or even dying. Many people have come down with just one or two panic attacks in their lifetime and the problem goes away, perhaps when a stressful situation ends. But if you've had recurrent, unexpected panic attacks and spent long periods in constant fear of another attack, you may have a condition called panic disorder. Although panic attacks themselves aren't less threatening, they can be frightening and significantly affect your quality of life, but treatment can be very effective. And listen, there is no denying that the economy is in rough shape, right? Inflation is a major problem. The American dream is harder to attain for young people today than it was for boomers when they were this age. My parents' generation, they were able to yeah, trade it's like harder than millennials. two pineapples and a bag of flour for a single family home with a half acre of land. And I may be slightly exaggerating, but the point is that a certain lifestyle was much easier to establish and maintain only a few decades ago. There's no denying. Oh, and then what happened, Matt? What's changing? Where is wealth being concentrated? Like a lot of it. And beyond the economy, it's also true that our culture is in, in bad shape. The situation abroad is even more volatile and so on. So there are challenges. There are difficult challenges. Nobody can pretend otherwise. That said, there is a real tendency to gross. But, but, look, it's true. You can't buy a house for two bags of flour and a potato anymore. It used to be the way, and I get that. Okay, times are a little tougher now. You might need four potatoes. I don't know what the current, you know, currency conversion rate is, any of that kind of stuff. But I will say this. You're kind of all cowards. You know, you're a bunch of babies. Uh, sort it out. Please exaggerate the difficulties that we face today. And it's not just Gen Z. In fact, I recently saw a viral meme that was uh, doing the, the, uh, the rounds on go. Twitter. And it has this whole uh, woe is me shtick, except for millennials. And the meme shows Matthew McConaughey oh. puffing on a cigarette with a shell-shocked look on his face, along with the caption, millennials living through Y2K, 9-11, a plague, two economic recessions, and a possible World War III before they turn 40. Now, it's true that some of those things were hard. <laughs> yeah, I know you got to do qualifiers before you talk about this. He's like, it is true that you can't buy houses for flour anymore. Okay, that, that, okay that's true. That's true. And it's harder now. Okay, fine. Whatever. And fine. Some of those things were intense and also hard on a lot of people. Ah, come on, you know, 
bootstraps and shit. On the other hand, if you're including Y2K on your list of generational traumas, then it's clear that you're really trying to pad the stats because Y2K is famous for being an occasion where literally nothing happened at all. As for the yeah. rest of it. Yeah, but, but what happened before nothing happened, Matt? Was there a mass panic? And was there a mass panic that was propagated in large part due to a lot of mainstream media being like, well, you know, it's going to happen. The countdown, it's 1999. As soon as it reaches 2000, all electronic devices, all of them, because we didn't figure this one out. They're all based on computers, you see, including the very planes that fly in our skies. So um, they're all just going to stop working. We don't know how to fix it. And so uh, you have to become Y2K compliant. Every one of you, we're going to sell you on how to become Y2K compliant because apparently we just couldn't figure out how numbers work, you know, in these fucking binary machines. But yeah, 1999 turns to 2000. Planes will fall from the sky. Satellites will explode. Your toaster will try to have sex with you. This is all going to happen. It's all real. It's all happening. So get ready. Prepare. Get these special discs you need. Some of you can take the floppy disks. Some of you can take the CDs. And the rest of you, you're fucked. You're all fucked. Enjoy the toaster. All right. It's already probably staring at you in your room. So get ready. Y2K is real. Pull a steps back. You can see that we have had it relatively easy by comparison. So we're going to go back to World example, War II, aren't we? That somebody born in 1910 would have, before retirement, lived through World War I, World War II, the Great Depression, the Spanish Flu, the Cold War, the Korean War, the Vietnam War, and a presidential assassination. That's only yeah, a partial list. That's all fucked. That's, that's a lot of stress. Somebody born a century before that would have experienced two wars or... By the way, Matt, that, that's not to discount the, the, the incredibly difficult times that have come before us. I don't know if you've heard of the bubonic plague. Uh, that, that didn't sound fun, you know, but there was a lot of anxiety back then. I, people would have known what to call it. That might be a different thing, right? And they wouldn't have had so much social media 24-7 constantly talking to them about the bubonic plague and everything. There wouldn't be a whole bunch of, like, you know, plague truthists who were like, the bubonic plague isn't real. In fact, you're supposed to spread it. It's what the Lord uh, has demanded. Yeah, th that would be a little bit different for sure. But it, it did not sound pleasant uh, by any measure. So, yeah, the, the, the hard times are hard. They, they, they are. That, that doesn't discount all of this information and data coming out. Shouldn't we be identifying these problems? Like, if someone's like, hey, by the way, it turns out that younger generations and younger generations who do spend a very large amount of their time online, uh, they seem to have a set of, a set of problems. And, and they seem to have these problems uh, that are just being reported in very high numbers, as the other generations before them didn't. And uh, yeah how can we help that? What's going on here? What does this explain, you know? And, and it is a multitude of factors. That part is true too. Of, of course, uh, economic anxiety and anxiety for the future would play heavy. I get like, I have that. I have that and I'm not a Gen Zer. And I'm constantly fucking thinking about like, we really got to figure a lot of this shit out, you know? Like TikTok on a lot of these things. And then you could read so much of it before you're like, oh, God damn it. What's happening? None. Of, wait, no, no more of those. But they were so cute. Oh, they're gone now. For how long? Forever. Oh, there are no more of them. We, oh, we, we made their ecosystem unlivable. That's kind of sad. Oh, that's too bad. So, but we're, we're going to save the other cute things, right? Not, not as of so far. That seems like everything is barreling towards that. Oh, wow. That's um. Okay, well, yeah. Ooh, a little anxiety there, you know? ...of human beings who've ever lived have faced turmoil and tragedy. Yeah, and I, like I would have empathy for someone who's like, I think it's really, really fucked up that at any given day, the Ruskies are about to drop the nuclear bomb on me. I should probably build myself a fallout shelter because, you know, all these pamphlets are making it look neat as if we're definitely going to survive a nuclear apocalypse by just having the right amount of fucking beans in cans. Better get all those cans ready and dig a really deep hole underneath my house because at any given day, nuclear bombs are going to fall upon all of us and we live in the radioactive age now. It's going to be wild, but we'll do fine, see? Let's listen to this radio program. That that sounds really stressful. That yeah, I I've talked to my parents about living through a lot of that shit. That that sounds scary as fuck. Okay, it. Good thing we're not really doing that anymore. You know, I, I have empathy for people who went through that. <laughs> this is the primer. It's lighter, but our shoulders are not as broad, and our backs are not as strong. And there are many reasons for this. We live in relative comfort and luxury, which has made us soft. We also, again, as a culture, are more secular, more naive. This is a multimillionaire. Like, are you kidding me? He, he said he makes off YouTube ads alone $100,000 a month. 
That's just off the YouTube ad revenue that he gets for the YouTube channel. We're not talking about whatever weird ass contracts because Daily Wire money. Holy fuck. We learn from Steven Crowder. Sometimes people can get a $50 million offer. So they have a lot of money to go around. So, you know, doing just fine. Just, just nice and cozy. Every single one of these pieces of shit, by the way, they always go for this aesthetic. You know, not just from the lumberjack shit all the way to like, you know, solid. Have you seen Tucker Carlson's like wood shop? You know, where it's like, this guy is the fucking, the, the heiress to the, the, the Swanson fortune. Like, this, this could not, you are the bourgeoisie. You you are the rich. You you are the fucking ruling class. The ones you talk about all the time in your show to try and do faux populism. But, like, don't sit there being like, you know, I really spend a lot of time in the wood shop. You know, this uh, is what helps me, grounds me. So I find my center. This is, this is who, who I'm about. Realistic, more than materialistic. And this has caused a kind of spiritual... Like, there's a goddamn banjo in the background, okay? Okay? It's a fucking banjo in the background. Can he play the... I've never seen him. Can he play the banjo? And if he can, I mean, that actually would, might actually be on brand or something like that. <laughs> you do strike me as one of the weird banjo players. There, there's amazing, there's beautiful, there's there's awesome progressive banjo players. I'm not trying to diminish people who play banjo. But there's also kind of sometimes just right-wing weirdos, where it's just like, that's the, the instrument of choice. So I'm just saying Matt Walsh would kind of fall into that category. Trophy. It has made us psychologically brittle, but, um, and, and things like dealing with the reality of death is, I think, much more difficult. Ever since Matt Walsh made a comment about how ice hockey players are little girls because they wear ice skates and uh, go to figure skating, it's been impossible for you not to notice every single thing he says is calculated to appear as manly as possible. Yeah, uh, I'd like to remind everybody that uh, Emma Vigland did challenge Matt Walsh uh, to a uh, trivia contest when it came to sports, and he has yet to reply to it. Sports challenge from a woman. That's really dominated by right-wing bro culture will matt walsh run from the moon's blood it's vigland v walsh is a woman more of a man than a man he ran he ran did not accept did not accept you know i, I even provided free promotional material i mean come on this is higher quality than tenant Tenant, you've seen Tenant, you've seen the whole Lauren Southern Tim Pool outfit, all right? I don't know who they hired, but I, I can do this. I can, I can make the promos. We got a promo here, you know, the promo for days. No response. I do have an opinion about abortion and other reproductive, quote unquote, reproductive issues, because as a man, I am 50% involved in reproduction. It is as much my issue as it is yours. I was also once an unborn baby. Uh, you know, we believe that we're going to die and 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 fade into non-existence, which I think makes death far more terrifying. Uh, anyway, so there's a lot going on, but underlying all of that is the uniquely modern assumption that life is supposed to be essentially pain-free. So we think that we are entitled to comfort, that we have the right to. Ben, I haven't heard people talk like this since, like, I think, you know, my grandfather was alive. Like, that's the kind of people who would, who would be like, uh, everyone thinks they should be getting a free ride and that, like, apparently there's not supposed to be suffering in the world and all that. And you're like, suffering? Well, I mean, we can say suffering bad, though, right? And, and limiting suffering would be better. And, like, let's, you know, I don't have to be all utilitarian here, but uh, less suffering on a larger scale, probably better. So let's work towards that. That's it's not a bad thing to, like... <laughs> and we say, no, it's not supposed to be this way. It's not fair. It's not fair. This is not how life is supposed to be. You see all these videos of Gen Z people that are, like, in tears because they have to work nine to five now. In tears about it. It's not supposed to be this way. This is not how life is supposed to be. No one in history thought that way. Everyone in history said, well, of course you have to work. What else, what else are you going to do in life? It's life. What do you mean? It's, it's not, not fair. Not fair compared to what? Most of the anxiety and trauma and psychological scarring comes not from the suffering, but really from this refusal to suffer. This insistence that life owes us something else, something better. Which in fact, when in fact it owes us nothing. Now, I'm not offering any kind of great insight here, but it's somehow an insight that has never occurred to a shockingly large number of people in modern culture. They have lived their whole lives without anyone responding to one of their complaints by saying, yeah, that's life, get over it. Stop crying, you sissy. I mean, that is a message we should all probably hear once a day. And if you're having a panic attack because, you know, of inflation, like you, the best thing you can hear from someone is get it together. What the hell is wrong with you?
Like you need to be able to function. This is embarrassing. Once a day, we should probably all hear something like that. And if not, so what he's referencing, by the way, I'm sure you're, um, most people have seen this viral video already. <sighs> I know I'm probably just being so dramatic and annoying, but this is my first job, like my first nine to five job after college. And I'm in person and I'm commuting in the city and it takes me fucking forever to get there. There's no way I'm going to be able to afford living in the city right now. So that's off the table. Like fucking duh. If I was able to walk to work and it w it'd be fine, but I'm not. So it literally takes me like I leave here. Like I get on the train at 730 and I don't get home till like 615 earliest. And then like I don't have time to do anything. I don't I want to shower eat my dinner and go to sleep i don't have time or energy to now you won't believe the fucking the bootlickers online who are just like oh fucking baby what you want a bottle too huh should i give you a blanket to help you on your commute lol lol and it's like it could it could be shitty commutes are shitty and i used to have to commute to work it fucking sucks commuting to work especially long distances every day if you're driving 45 minutes to one direction if it's like an hour and a half every day just in commuting thank god the podcast exists because then you can at least listen to something and try and tune your brain into something else every single day but yeah that eats up a lot of your fucking day when you're going somewhere and when you're being paid minimum wage like you just look at the clock oh you're just like yep yeah, yeah five minutes went by all right five five more uh, six minutes. Should have looked. Should have looked. Should have. Should have just waited. Could have waited. Yeah. No, I'm not gonna look. Not gonna do it this time. This time, definitely a lot of time has passed. We're good. We're good. Just, just a little look. It's gonna feel good. You gotta have six minutes. Still, fucking hell. All right. Did all right. We're gonna keep doing this. Avoid suffering and hardship. And those are assumptions that our ancestors would have never made. Our ancestors encountered. Ah, you know what this just also reminded me of. Uh, Matt Walsh. Speaking of suffering and hardship. Laundry, so doesn't know how to do his own laundry. I kid you not. This man has admitted on camera to not knowing how to do his own fucking laundry. He doesn't know how to clean himself. Oh, I, I think I have that one. I like it. All right, Drew. Well, this is a trick question because I have not done anything around the house for, for, for 40 years. I've been a completely <laughs> useless, but it's, it's clear that if I had to choose, it would be, it would have to be dishes because she was just out of town for a month and I actually called her up and said, how do you do laundry? So, so I think this is the only thing I know how to do. All right, to the answers. Ben, you answered dishes. Mrs. Shapiro said, I'm not sure Ben knows how to do laundry, so I'll go with the dishes, which he does quite often. And she threw in a little thanks, hun. Matt, you answered, I hate them both, but dishes. Your wife said dishes. And she also threw in, he doesn't know how to do the laundry. Again, being thrown under the bus. True. 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 Yeah. yeah I, don't, I don't know how to clean. Yeah, no. No, I don't know how to. Don't know how to clean the stains. True. Michael, you answered dishes. Your wife said neither, but if there was a gun to his head, he would choose dishes. And Drew, finally, you answered, I don't do anything but the dishes if I had to. And your wife put again in all caps here, very forceful answer. Since he doesn't know how to do laundry, <laughs> as we learned when I was out of town for several weeks. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. I don't, I don't know how to clean my own shit stains. It's fucking yeah. Uh, sorry, honey. <laughs> well, now she's gonna start joking about divorce. She jokes a lot. That one. Yeah, and always like ah, no fault. <laughs> I'm guessing it's the dishes. <laughs> and yeah. Yes. Do you enjoy the surfs, but prefer not to have to use your eyeballs? Many are saying this. Well, we've got the solution for you. It's the Surf Times in podcast form. Available on most major podcasting networks now. If you enjoy it, please consider leaving a good review and feedback because it really helps the show out, apparently, and it's free. Just like the podcast. Thank you so much for watching, everybody. This show is produced by amazing people like you. And if you want to help us out, please consider donating over at patreon.com slash the surfs. The show was made possible thanks to Amazing Fletch, Anna Loves Riley, Ariane McCarthy, Cheryl Alvarez, Doug Cady, Everything Important, Hegbard Celine, La Media Panza, Matthew Scarborough, Multimondi, Omni, Peanut Butter Blondie, Political Papi, Quiet185, Rachel K, Riley and Anna, Roller Dragon, Ruby K, Sir Nickus, Spinach Monster, Stellar Vision, Sebastian Demo, Tech Tink, Trevbot EXE, Words Greenwood, and not to mention all of the amazing and fabulous people you now see before you.